Hello, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday's webinar, ESG webinar. Today, part two of uh, Beth of ESG Days 2023. My name is Helmut Messmann. I'm the past president, and I'm honored that my co chair is our new president, Ian Granek. Uh, we both will chair this session. Um, for those who have joined us a couple of weeks ago, we started with uh, the upper and lower GI abstracts. And today we have um, ERCP, US, and core endoscopy. And we have uh, again selected, or our experts have selected 12 great abstracts. And luckily, all of the abstract presenters are also today here and can uh, answer your questions. So please use your uh, um, QA. Um, we will have the first uh, presentations on ERCP. Um, and then we have time for 10 minutes for the discussion. And then we uh, continue with EUS and the last will be um, the core endoscopy. And uh, now I would like to introduce our both presenters, which is uh, uh, Pierre Depré and uh, Paris Golfakis from Greece. Um, welcome, uh, Pierre, and welcome, Paris. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you did this uh, job to select um, this abstract. And I think I am, uh, we, we really appreciate that uh, this is always a, a very time consuming job. And uh, we know um, there are hundreds of abstracts which need to be selected. And thank you for your efforts. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Pierre and Paris. It's great that you've agreed to be here and, and we appreciate you taking the time to, to prepare the presentations tonight. Uh, we like to have these best of ESGE days. There are people, I'm sure, listening now who were in with, with us in, in Dublin. There were those who weren't with us. If you weren't with us, we'd love to see you next year in Berlin in April of uh, 2024. But um, why, don't we, why don't we proceed so we stay on time helmet? And I will uh, give the microphone to uh, Paris Golfakis from Athens, Greece, who will pre present the first abstracts on ERCP. Thank you, Ayan. Thank you, Helmut. I would like to thank ESG for the opportunity. So during the next couple of minutes, and I would like to save some time if possible, we will see the first uh, best ERCP abstracts. And I would like to make clear that this is a personal selection, however, based on the scores provided by the scientific committee of the Congress. So here are the four abstracts that I will present. I will go directly to the first one. So this is an abstract coming from uh, France. Uh, presented by Enrique Perez Quadrado Robles in Dublin. We know that the percutaneous tracepatic biliary drainage is indicated in patients with failed ERCP or in patients that they have a surgically altered anatomy. However, we don't have any data assessing uh, the role of dedicated percutaneous cholangioscopes. The aim of this study was to assess the feasibility and safety of percutaneous endoscopic cholangioscopy using the new short dedicated device. The main outcomes that were evaluated in the study was the clinical success, uh, defined as a complete duct clearance in case of um, bile duct stones or uh, as a collect of histopathological samples in case of uh, strictures, as well as uh, technical success uh, and adverse events. This was an uh, observational multicenter retrospective study where all patients undergoing percutaneous cholangioscopy using the spike glass discovered from 2020 to 2022 were included. Uh, PTBD was performed according to local practice and both internal and external drains were used. Uh, just to show you the new the, the, the spike glass discovered, this is a 10.8 French single use uh, uh, cholangioscope that is advanced under fluoroscopy and endoscopy control. It comes with a 1.2 millimeters working channel with a dual dedicated irrigation and has an important maneuverability and a large angulation ability. So 51 patients were included in the study. And as you may anticipate, the vast majority of them were patients with other anatomy. And the main indication was uh, biliary stones or biliary stones combined with the uh, strictures of the bile duct. You may also anticipate that the vast majority, almost two thirds of the patients underwent a uh, prior tract dilation before inserting the cholangioscope. The clinical success for stones was 96.6% with a median of one session needed to clear the bile duct, while in 57% of the cases, 29 of them, a uh, hemicrogravlic lithotripsy was also performed. 
In patients with um, strictures, there was uh, 17 of them. The clinical success, so the possibility to obtain some was at 100%. And the diagnostic accuracy of the modality was 94.1%. Overall, for all patients, technical success was 100% and 7.6% uh, of patients developed at least one adverse event in the median follow-up of seven months. So the main result for this study is that the clinical success is 96.6% for stones and 100% for biopsies. Technical success was 100% and adverse events at 7.6%. The main conclusion that we may draw is that percutaneous endoscopic hollandioscopy is an effective and safe modality. And for the future, we should better define indications and uh, it will also be very important to standardize the procedure if possible. Let's move to the second abstract, that is the lack of effect of endoluminal radiofrequency ablation um, and stem patency in patients with cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer. This was a randomized control trial presented by Jana Yarosova from uh, Czech Republic. We know that treatment of cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer is challenging. Few patients are eligible for surgery and palliative treatment has also limited efficacy. The aim of this study was to study the effect of uh, endoluminal RFA as a palliative treatment modality for patients with cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer. This was an randomized control trial as already mentioned from uh, three centers in the public. And there were two groups of patients, patients that received uh, endoluminal stenting and RFA and patients who received only stenting. Overall, 161 patients were enrolled, 85 patients with cholangiocarcinoma and 76 patients with pancreatic cancer. The primary outcome of the study was the survival and the secondary outcome was stent patency. You see here the flow chart of the study, as well as the baseline demographic characteristics of the patients. So these are the couple of my curves for cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer uh, on the left and the right side of the slide uh, and regarding survival. And as we may anticipate, there was no difference in the survival of patients treated with both uh, standing and RFA versus only standing. Uh, we should notice that uh, in patients with cholangiocarcinoma who received um, RFA and standing, survival was uh, poorer and received at the same time an uh, additional oncological therapy, these patients had a poor survival compared to patients that received only stenting. There was no uh, respective difference in the group of pancreatic cancer patients. Here are the results about stent patency. And as we may anticipate, in different time points, at three, six, nine, and 12 months respectively, there was no difference in terms of stent patency in both groups. So for this study, the main result is that survival three months was less than 25% for both groups of patients with cholangiocarcinoma and less than 15 patients for patients with pancreatic cancer. Uh, the stent patency at 12 months was uh, 50 to 60% for patients with cholangiocarcinoma and around 85% for pancreatic cancer. We can uh, conclude that RFA plus stenting had a similar survival rate, patency rate compared to stenting alone for this uh, particular group of patients. However, patients with cholangiocarcinoma receiving at the same time RFA and oncological treatment had poorer survival, and there was no effect of RFA on stent patency. For the future, it would be nice to predict responders, check if disease stage could play a role or the site of obstruction could also be a significant factor of uh, efficacy. Let's move to the third abstract. Uh, this prophylactic antibiotics in endoscopic retrograde cholangiopacreatography with peroral cholangioscopy. This study was presented in Dublin by Arvid Gustafsson from Sweden. We know very well in our centers that the use of single operator cholangioscopy is uh, rapidly expanding. However, we also know that these patients may carry a high risk for infections. In the literature for the time being, there is only scarce data about the need for antibiotic prophylaxis when performing single operator cholangioscopy. So this was a retrospective study uh, based on the uh, register of a garlic study, where the primary outcome was the rate of infectious complications at 30 days after cholangioscopy and uh, the rate of adverse events at 30 days. Uh, the authors went through a huge database, including more than 124,000 ERCP procedures from uh, where they selected 
2,321 ERCPs with cholangioscopy. And uh, among these, there were 1,843 uh, procedures where antibiotic prophylaxis was uh, administrated and uh, 478 procedures without any antibiotic prophylaxis. Very interestingly and uh, well done, the authors adjusted their results for different factors that could affect uh, the outcomes, including sex, age, as a score, the data that was cannulated, if there was performed or not a pre-cut septerotomy, the time of the procedure, if there was or not a, a PHC in the background, and if the center that performed the procedure was a high or a low volume centers. After adjusting for all these different uh, factors, these are the results that were presented. You may see that the infectious complication uh, was 3.5% for the group that received antibiotic prophylaxis compared to 3.8% for the group that didn't receive any antibiotic prophylaxis. So there was no significant difference between uh, the infectious complication rate. Uh, similarly, the rate of adverse events in the group that received antibiotic prophylaxis was a uh, 14.7% compared to 17% for the group of the patients that didn't receive any antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, also, there was no statistical significant difference for this uh, group. Uh, however, and the, the authors underline some limitations of the study, including the fact that there could be a selection bias due to the retrospective design of the study, um, that there were no clear criteria for antibiotic prophylaxis administration in the registry of the study, that probably they were unable to adjust for potentially important risk factors that they were not taken into account, and of course that there was a study that they didn't provide any significant result even if we know that negative studies are also very useful studies for our everyday clinical practice. So the main results of this uh, study was that the infection complications was 3.5% for patients receiving antibiotic prophylaxis compared to 3.8% for those that didn't receive any. The adverse event rate was 14.7% compared to 70% for patients that didn't receive antibiotic prophylaxis. The main conclusion could be that there is a low rate of post-COC cholangiitis, but this is still important and the thus antibiotic prophylaxis may be needed for uh, selected patients, and that there is um, a non-negligible rate of post uh, single operator cholangioscopy adverse event, as we saw around 14 and 17% respectively. In the future, we probably could stratify the administration of um, antibiotics when we perform cholangioscopy based on the indication, if there's a therapeutic uh, indication uh, or if it's a diagnostic uh, indication, and of course, it would be nice to have some prospective data that could confirm uh, these results. We now move to the last uh, abstract that I would like to present, and that is uh, entitled a randomized trial to study the effect of lactic common bile duct stent versus no stent on recurrence of common bile duct stones and biliary complications in patients waiting for cholecystectomy after biliary clearance. Uh, this study was presented by Harsal Manbathar in, from India. We know very well from our guidelines that the EEG recommends biliary stenting in cases of incomplete common bile duct stone clearance. Uh, however, the role of stenting in case of complete clearance of the bile duct when the gallbladder is in situ remains controversial and there is only some uh, retrospective data available in the literature. The authors in this study aimed to study the effect of a CBD stent versus no stent in reducing the recurrence of, C of common bile duct stones while uh, waiting for cholecystectomy. This was a single center randomized control trial that uh, was uh, conducted from September 2021 to November 2022. You may anticipate the inclusion criteria as well as the exclusion criteria of the study. Mainly the basic uh, inclusion criteria was any patient with cholecodilithiasis with concomitant uh, gallstones uh, where uh, common bile duct stones clearance was achieved. So the first group received Stenting and the second group didn't receive any stent after the clearance of the common bile duct. The follow up was uh, really strict. Patients were followed up for three months after ERCP with a uh, blood test and uh, clinical evaluation at week one, week four, week eight, and week 12. While patients also underwent EUS or MRCP or uh, abdominal ultrasound at uh, three months in order to evaluate any CBDS recurrence. The primary outcome was the rate of um, common bile duct stones recurrence and secondary outcomes uh, included first biliary, any biliary and pancreatic adverse event, and secondly, the need to repeat ERCP. 
This is the flow chart of the study. And as you see, 34 uh, patients from the group A, that was the group that received uh, the stent, uh, were finally included in the analysis compared to 32 patients from the group that didn't receive any stent. Here are the results of the study. You may see that there was no statistically significant difference regarding the primary outcome, outcome since the recurrence rate of CBD stones was 7% in the stent group compared to, excuse me, we're 21% at the stent group compared to 9.4% at the no stent group. However, this uh, uh, difference was not statistically significant as the p-value was 0 0.3. Uh, it's uh, of interest that two patients in the stent group developed cholestitis, cholestitis after the RCP, while three patients only in the stent group developed post-RCP pancreatitis. However, both uh, differences were not statistically significant. Finally, the need for repeat ERCP was similar between the two groups, 18 to 10% almost uh, for the no-stent group. So the main result that we may conclude from this um, uh, study was that um, the recurrence of CBD stones was 21% uh, in the group uh, that received stent compared to 9.4% in the group that didn't receive any stent. However, this um, difference didn't reach the level of statistical significance. The stent group uh, presented two cases of cholestitis and three cases of post rcp pancreatitis. The main conclusion is that uh, there is comparable rate of CBD, uh, CBDS recurrence in the two groups while the stent group present adverse event, uh, while, while no adverse event was uh, noted in the no stent group. In the future, it would be nice to evaluate the effect, if any, of stenting on surgery outcomes. Also, the effect of diet, demographic characteristics, or other factors in the recurrence of CBD stones would be nice to be evaluated. So this was the four abstracts selected from ERCP section, and it would be nice to um, invite all four ASA presenters in the panel in order to proceed with the discussion. Thank you very much. Really very nice presentation of, of those four abstracts, which were all very, very good abstracts. Um, I don't think I had uh, reminded everybody in the audience, you can actually send us questions through the, the Q&A. Um, so I invite everybody to uh, send questions uh, that you may have for for the uh, abstract uh, authors, because we do have them here. Helmut, do you, do you have any questions? Do you want to start with a question? Well, uh, yeah. But first of all, I would like a, a special thank you to our colleague in India, because he's also today here. Uh, thank you to everybody, for sure. We have 12 abstracts. All, uh, all abstract authors are here, but uh, for time difference, thank you. Thank you to India. Now, uh, uh, thank you for the, the, the lecture, Paris. My, my take home message is, from your uh, four or uh, abstract, doing less is more. No? Sometimes we overtreat or we do too much and, and, and we can save costs. Sorry, this is, this was my dog in the background. <laughs> and I'm wondering, um, and maybe this is a question to, to, to Jana, um, or also Paris, um, RFA, uh, we had a similar study in Germany, and there was also no effect. Maybe we should do subgroup analysis to show an effect that maybe in some cases we have a benefit, or do you think it's worthless to use RFA uh, in, in, in malignant uh, bidex structures? Uh, so we did sub-analysis in each group for basement classification, or for patients according to TMN classification or according if they receive oncological treatment or not, but there were no significant differences between the subpopulations. So, 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 so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take that a step further because I have a question for you, Jana, as well. Um, first of all, it's very nice that you did a randomized trial. My question to you is. Did you meet your power calculations in terms of the numbers? In other words, did we really just not see a difference because this was this was a beta error and you didn't have enough subjects to to actually show a statistical difference between the groups? Uh, actually, uh, this is a very good question because we we collected one hundred sixty one patients, but if we uh, divided them into sub subgroups, th these groups were actually quite small. It was around. 
10 patients or 12 patients in each group. So maybe if, but uh, also uh, originally the study was designed for 100 to 250 patients, but we did okay. internal analysis uh, in the middle and it seems there is no, that the, there wouldn't be any difference if we finish the, the study. So I think. There is a question in the Q&A to the first abstract from yeah. UK uh, regarding uh, side effects. So was severe pancreatitis completely avoided uh, with this procedure? This is, I mean, seems to be logic, but what, what were severe events? Uh, once more again, if you can repeat and comment. Yeah, sure. So uh, it's important to highlight that the adverse events were separated from the PDBD related adverse events and the cholangioscopy related adverse events. In both cases, there were no acute pancreatitis related to the procedures. And it's also important to know that most of adverse events in our study were related to the previous percutaneous drainage at 12% uh, uh, at, uh, of cases and only 8% of cases of mild to moderate adverse events, cholangitis in most of cases, were related to cholangioscopy, but no acute pancreatitis was diagnosed. Thanks, Enrique. There's another question here from the audience is uh, for the study from India. Uh, can the authors explain the adverse events that were seen in the stent group? Yeah, hi. Am hi. I audible? Hello. Yeah, 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 we hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, the first question is, uh, what was the reason for, uh, what can be the reason for cholecystitis in the stent group? So what we think is that the stent is obstructing the flow uh, of the slip stone from the gallbladder, uh, which if the stent was not there, there was a smooth, there could have been a smooth flow of the slip stone from gallbladder into the CBD and out into the TOD. But however, the stent uh, is there in place in the CBD and hence obstructing the the smooth flow of the uh, stone. So that might uh, cause obstruction of the neck of the gallbladder, and that might be the reason for cholecystitis. Then okay. another, another question is uh, explanation for adverse events in stent group. So uh, post ERCB pancreatitis uh, is a known uh, adverse event, uh, more often found in stented patients than in no stent patients. We have data for that. And uh, for cholecystitis, I have already given the explanation. Mm -hmm. And what there, there, the, Yeah, there's actually a follow-up that they're asking about in terms of the CBD stent group, uh, what kind of stent was used? Was it plastic? How, what was the length? What was the diameter? Yeah, so plastic stents, 7.7 .7 centimeter or 10.7 centimeter uh, double pigtail stents were used. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a question. I have a question from Arvid. If uh, may I ask, Arvid, based on yeah. the results of your study, would you change your clinical practice when you perform cholangioscopy now? Would you administrate antibiotics or not? Um, I'm not entirely sure. We actually I performed a cholangioscopy today, with, in which I didn't administer antibiotics, but uh, <clears throat> I uh, we performed some. Um, uh, biopsy bites and perhaps in afterhand or after we decided to do this I I was thinking about maybe we should give this patient antibiotics because now we have been more invasive mm -hmm. so and, and, I, and... I, I still feel unsure <laughs> I have all the question to you um, maybe I missed it uh, when did you give the antibiotics before during or after the procedure I didn't mention it uh, yeah, that's a good question. In, in the register, it's not specified exactly this, so it's it's a limitation also. Uh, it's it's specified if it's a prophylaxis uh, shortly after or before. Uh, we ex we have excluded all patients on therapy already. There is none. Were you able to identify what antibiotics were usually given? Was there sort of a common theme of what types of antibiotics? No, fortunately, no. not no. Okay. okay. So there are no 
additional question in the chat or in the uh, I have one question for Enrique. Uh, Aris, please, please. Yeah, so, Enrique, we know that you also perform the EUS guided uh, ERCP. Okay. So, uh, what benefit you see in uh, performing PTBD using the spyglass discover compared to performing EUS anastomosis and proceed with the classical way? Since the, the vast majority of the patients were patients with surgical agro anatomy. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, this is a very good point. It's true that even if we are usually talking now about altered anatomy, altered anatomy, there are a lot, a lot of different settings. So for sure, there are more and more data showing that uh, patients presenting with previous bypass or uh, pre patients presenting with uh, previous surgical gastrojejunostomy could eventually under underwent very easily or more easily US-guided drainage. But most of these patients in this study have uh, isojejunal uh, rooks and eye uh, surgical uh, anatomy. So in these cases, it's quite difficult in the US guided uh, techniques to identify the biliary limb, it's quite difficult. So in, mes in most of these cases, we had uh, either a previous percutaneous drainage already in place, because sometimes we, we this is the starting point, uh, or either patients with uh, isojejunal uh, rooks and eye uh, anatomy and so in these cases sometimes it's better to go uh, by percutaneous approach. I agree, I agree. Okay, well. um, can, I, can I ask another question? Um, so Harshal, I have a question for you. I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Yana. So you did a randomized controlled trial. Did, did you meet your power calculations? In other words, you didn't see a difference, but is that again, is that because of a beta error? You just didn't have enough subjects or do you think your results are really true that it was a negative study? No, so actually, I would like to admit that uh, this is an underpowered study. Uh, it's like just a pilot kind of a study, which has uh, showed up some data, whether the stent is beneficial or not. And then we need larger, larger multicenter randomized trial that can actually validate our findings. Are you planning on doing that? Yeah, yeah we have already planned 480 patients. Great. Okay. Fantastic. There is one last question, the Q and A, and then I think we shall yeah. continue with. Uh... It's a question for Arvid that has been answered it uh, online, but uh, we could ask a uh, reply for the, our audience. Arvid, was there any difference in septic complications in uh, uh, single operative angioscopy antibiotic prophylaxis between patients receiving more aggressive treatment, therapeutic treatment, like lithotripsy, or patients uh, performing only a pure diagnostic uh, procedure? Yeah, this I've, I've written an answer also. I, this was uh, noted. Uh, I was in the limitations that we have have not been able to explicitly adjust for uh, number of biopsies and how uh, invasive you have been. So only procedure time is kind of a surrogate measure for this. But but yeah. all of these are very good points to look for uh, during a prospective uh, data collection. Huh? Yes, definitely. Okay, I think for time reasons, we should move on with our second part. Thank you again to Enrique, Jana, Arvid, Harshal, and Paris for the presentation and the very uh, uh, live discussion. Okay, thanks. Now let's continue with the uh, second presentation of Pierre Depré. I think Pierre to introduce is not necessary. Everybody knows him. Everybody who is doing EUS should know Pierre Depré. Uh, Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> So he's he's our expert in ESG or one of our experts um, uh, for EUS and also responsible in the scientific committee. So Pierre, you did uh, also select out of hundreds of uh, great abstracts um, a selection of four uh, uh, US uh, uh, abstracts, and we are now very excited. What was your selection, Pierre? Yeah, not not an easy selection because indeed they were a very nice and very interesting abstracts. So I hope you can see my screen. Um, yeah, I, I would have to. I would like to start with this. Uh, I think, uh, as we said on the last day of the ESG days, uh, the US field is very active. There is uh, for sure a shift of interest from the RCP to US or the combination of the RCP and US, as you have seen in the RCP highlights. Uh, there were a total of uh, 16 US sessions, and it, those were quite uh, crowded sessions with sometimes participants who could not even get into the room. And these um, submissions were on new indications, new devices, new processes, and we understand that barriers are uh, slowly falling down. So it was quite difficult for me to select four abstracts, so I decided to select the best core abstracts on four different uh, subjects. 
Most of them, um, I'm afraid to say, are about uh, therapy. I'm, yeah, I like therapy, uh, therapeutic uh, EUS. And the first one I chose was a, a very nice submission from, uh, from Italy, uh, presented by Stefano Crino. And I think he is on the way to publish this data on uh, US guided radiofrequency ablation versus surgical resection for uh, pancreatic insulinoma. So we know that these are the most common functional uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but uh, fortunately, most of them are benign tumors. And uh, the mainstay treatment for these tumors is uh, was, I would say, was surgery in expert centers, uh, mostly by doing enucleation of the tumor. But surgery is associated with a high rate of uh, adverse events, as most mostly uh, uh, POPs, which are the pancreatic fistula occurring in uh, almost 50% of cases, uh, delayed gastric emptying, and post -pancreatic uh, pancreatectomy hemorrhage. Uh, we know that we have, uh, I would say recently, but this is now a couple of years, and I remember tested some needles 20 years ago. So these are now um, uh, commercialized uh, needles. Uh, they were initially used in unfit uh, for surgery patients, but now we have some uh, nice uh, data from small series on treatment of those pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, so the study presented was a retrospective data from uh, 23 centers, uh, eight high volume, and the method used was a propensity score analysis. Uh, with uh, different uh, covariates, as shown in this slide. Uh, the primary aim was to compare safety of uh, EUS RFA ablation and surgery, and the secondary aims were uh, treatment effectiveness, uh, length of hospital stay, and recurrences. Uh, starting from uh, uh, 304 patients, uh, they selected 89 patients uh, with RFA and 89 with surgical uh, treatments. And the types of surgery, as you see, were either pancreatoduodenectomy, distal pancreatectomy, central pancreatectomy, or enucleation. Most were enucleation of distal pancreatectomy. The size of the lesion was about 13 millimeter, and most of the lesions were, of course, G1 uh, tumors. As you see on the primary outcome, there is a significant uh, uh, difference on the overall adverse events between RFA, 18%, and surgery, 61%, and also in the severe adverse events. And the most common adverse events with surgery were pancreatic fistula and acute pancreatitis, mostly in patients with uh, a small lesions and lesions close to the main pancreatic duct. This was mainly for uh, RFA, of course. Uh, concerning the, surgery, the secondary outcomes, you see that the relapse rate is slightly higher with EOS RFA, and this is a question we could discuss later on during the uh, Q&A um, part of this um, uh, session. Hospital stay was, of course, shorter with RFA, and the follow-up was slightly shorter, but significantly shorter with uh, the RFA group. So very interesting result, but of course, uh, Stefano, uh, as you see on the picture here, uh, acknowledged that it, this was a retrospective nature of the study, this is not a randomized study, and the randomized study seems very difficult to, uh, to start, and I think he will maybe give a comment on this. Uh, there is a different duration of follow-up, and only tertiary care centers were involved, and there was no standardization of the endoscopic and surgical techniques. But for sure, and especially in my center, we almost never do um, uh, surgery for insulinoma anymore. So these were the guys organizing the EGLAs in Dublin, which was a great success. So this was the slide to move to the next uh, presentation from uh, Giuseppe Vanella on behalf of an uh, international uh, group, but um, led by uh, Paolo Acidicano about US guided uh, gastro gastroenterostomy for malignant gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, we know that this frequently affects patients with uh, pancreatobiliary and gastrointestinal malignancies. Uh, traditionally, these patients are either treated by surgical bypass, which is quite invasive, or by enteral stenting with a limited uh, stent patent. They uh, delivered data on all consecutive EUS GE performed at San Rafael Institute for malignant uh, gastric outlet obstruction between uh, in two years, 20 to 22, 
uh, enrolled in the prospective registry of therapeutic endoscopic ultrasound uh, protects that includes more uh, more types of uh, therapeutic procedures. The detect daily evaluation of post procedural uh, outcomes and the hospital charts review and uh, follow up was done uh, every 30 days after discharge. They use the West technique, which is a wireless EOS G simplified technique, putting a nasal uh, general drain uh, at the site of the angle of threads, then putting the EOS scope close to the general loop, filling the loop, and then going for straight hot hackios um, lamps placements in the loop as seen in this, uh, in this picture. The primary outcome was in fact clinical success. The other ones were secondary outcomes, such as uh, technical success, adverse events, symptom recurrence, hospital stay, and uh, survival and times, time uh, to refeeding. Starting from 76 candidates, they selected uh, 70 patients in this study because some were lost for follow-up or some had uh, contraindications. And you see that most of these patients were patients with pancreatic cancer, 75%. Um, some had uh, ascites or carcinomatosis, so you see that uh, some ascites and some carcinomatosis is not a contraindication for performing this uh, technique. And you see that uh, uh, technical success was uh, 97%. They had some uh, misdeployment, as you see. Uh, some were treated, especially type 1, uh, by redo EUS uh, gastroenterostomy, but uh, two patients needed surgery. So maybe we could ask uh, uh, Giuseppe uh, what was the reason for these uh, failures. Uh, the clinical success in intention to treat population was very high, 94%, procedure duration 45 minutes. And very interestingly, I think compared to surgery, because we know that patients with surgical uh, gastrojejunal anastomosis it takes a while before they can start um, tolerating fluids and solids. You see one day for fluids, one and a half day for soft solids, and with a hospital stay between three and 11 days, uh, mean uh, six days. The outcomes, uh, um, no complaints in 88% of cases, some vomiting. So you have to give anti-vomiting uh, medication to these patients to avoid uh, dislodgement of the stand. And you see adverse events were seen in 12% uh, percent of patients. Uh, two patients died, but um, not uh, directly from the procedure. Uh, these patients had malignant diseases, and the most frequent adverse events was bleeding at the EUSG site treated with epinephrine injection. Uh, seemed also very interesting, symptom recurrence, you see only 7.6% with a median estimated symptom survival, free, uh, survival of 455 days, so uh, almost uh, one year and a half. And of course, this, most of these patients have a fat, fat, fatal uh, outcome at the end. Uh, to conclude, in this single standard study, um, a very high and fast clinical relief of structuring, excellent long-term patency, acceptable safety profile. So I think a very interesting data showing that this is uh, for sure the way to go and has uh, advantages for surgery, but you know that prospective trials are now uh, set up to compare, compare surgery with uh, endoscopic um, gastric outlet obstruction relief. Going to the third paper, now we go to the biliary tract, and this was a study from, uh, from um, an international group but led by uh, Hyderabad and presented by Yahanta, Yahanta uh, Samantha on uh, PTBD versus US-guided hepatogastrosomy, but focus on higher obstruction. We, we have data on uh, malignant obstruction, but mostly on distal obstruction, this uh, submission was about Hyler, and there is no um, precise data on this topic. There were two recent publications, but you see that these publications for the first one was combining distal and proximal obstruction with, of course, a good success of uh, EOS-guided approach. 
And the second one was a combination of benign and malignant uh, hyalur structure. You see, it included also uh, post surgical anatomical uh, changes with also a good clinical success with uh, EOS guided bilirubin drainage. So, this uh, study was a retrospective multi center study, including five tertiary uh, care academic hospitals between uh, 2018 and 2022, uh, comparing left sided PTBD. So, this is left sided PTBD compared to US hepatogastrostomy for malignant hyalur uh, obstruction. Inclusion criteria were also including primary. Uh, drainage of failed or non-feasible ERCP. And you will see that in their results, almost half of the patient had primary uh, PTBD or EUS guided drainage. And that's maybe a question we could discuss um, during the Q&A part. Exclusion criteria was, of course, a distal obstruction and benign cause of hyalur obstruction. On this, side, uh, this slide, I would like to focus on the clinical success, which is defined as an improvement of simple of cholangitis, and also on effective biliary drainage, which is defined as a reduction in bilirubin by more than 50% at baseline in two weeks, or bilirubin less than three milligrams per deciliter four weeks after biliary drainage. And when we see the outcome measures, they look to clinical success. And in the secondary outcomes, they looked also at effective biliary drainage. And you see, this is not mentioned on, on the presenting slide, but I think it's an important uh, secondary outcome as shown in the results. So you see, they included uh, 97 patients with uh, US guided uh, drainage and uh, 190 PTBD. Um, there were no significant difference between age, gender, duration of symptoms. There were some difference, uh, and this was quite surprising. You see that although we are speaking about higher uh, obstruction, they included 25% uh, of pancreatic cancers and 25% of other tumors than gallbladder cancer or cholangiocarcinoma. So I guess this includes metastatic uh, patients also. Bilirubin was the same. And uh, you see that 60% had primary uh, drainage without any prior ERCP or PTBD, and the, the rest was uh, failed on non-feasible ERCP. And you see that on the primary outcome, clinical success was 82% with um, uh, EOS and 68% with PTBD, and effective drainage, as defined earlier, 87% with uh, EOS drainage and 56% only with PTBD. These were significant difference, also differences in the complications, hospital stay, late adverse events, and re-intervention rates, which were higher in the PGBD group, as we know, with those um, uh, drain blockages and uh, dislodgements. Concerning the predictors for clinical success, the um, grade of uh, high low obstruction was, of course, a uh, factor, and also the fact that uh, US was used rather than PTBD, you see that there was a significant difference. Uh, so interesting uh, data, but with some limitations, retrospective uh, design, only left drainage. US group included 50% uh, of non klatsky non gallbladder tumors, so maybe easier to, uh, to treat. And maybe the results look, look too good, but that's, I think, usually when you do a retrospective for multi-center academic uh, tertiary center uh, study. So let's move then to the last uh, abstract I selected. And I like this uh, I like this abstract. It's a video abstract, but I'm, I won't be able to show the video, but I think it's interesting to, um, to, to, to see that we can uh, change our way to, to work and gold bladder, gold bladder EOS guided drainage is for sure something that is maybe different between Asia and Europe because you know that in Asia, um, for example, in China, uh, China, China uh, patients like to keep their gold bladder than getting it removed, which is not uh, so, so far the case in, uh, in Europe. So as the introduction, we know that uh, LAMPS uh, guided uh, gallbladder drainage is not performed and uh, in many countries for cholecystitis or recurrent cholecystitis in patients who are not good candidates for surgery, usually in older patients with a limited life expectancy. 
And those stems are frequently left in situ indefinitely or as a permanent indwelling drainage because the patients are old and we don't want to get back to them. But in fact, those lamps are not designed for that, for permanently indwelling stems. So uh, Rasti Kunda from uh, well, working in Belgium with uh, Anthony Theo working in Hong Kong, they introduced a protocol where those patients uh, not candidates for cholecystectomy and having a life expectancy longer than 12 months, they decided to perform uh, cholangioscopy in the gallbladder with a box uh, six weeks after lamps placement. And this was combined with a cholecystogram to check for cystic, per, uh, cystic duct permeability or with a pneumo cholecystogram. And uh, also they tried to clear the stones and use EHL to clear the stones if there were still stones present. And only once completely clearance was achieved as well as patency of the cystic duct lamps was completely removed. And then they followed the patient up to see the outcome. And you see what you can do. You can get this uh, cholangioscope or endoscope through the, to the lamps. You can look inside the gallbladder. You can treat those remaining stones. You can do other diagnosis also, of course, if you think there might be dysplasia or cancer. And you see these results on 175 uh, patients. Uh, the lamps was removed due to spontaneous stone clearance in 76% of those patients, and in 23% of those patients, residual stones were treated with EHL and endoscopy. The mean number of sessions was 1.6, and you see the number of uh, deep box sessions, one, two, three, and of course, a good correlation with the number of EHL sessions going up to three. And you see there were only four patients at the third session who would still needed a treatment at that uh, stage. In uh, 29 cases, uh, cystic dependency was not confirmed and uh, no stent was left in situ in all the 175 patients once complete stone clearance was confirmed or remaining stones were uh, destroyed. No adverse events during follow-up. All procedures were performed at outpatient, which is interesting, one-day surgery. And a, a, a very long uh, follow-up, medium follow-up, you see, seven, seven, seven days, more, almost two years. And recurrent cholecystitis only observed in 2.9% of cases. I think it's quite interesting. And you see that in these five cases, three got new US GBD and two cases were for uh, surgery. So to conclude, this is a quite proactive approach, uh, quite novel and uh, direct uh, per oral cholecystoscopy seems to be a feasible and safe procedures. And um, most of these stents could be removed. So there is no need for permanently indwelling stents, but of course, further randomized control studies are warranted. I think these four papers cover different topics of uh, therapeutic US with new ideas, new concepts. And I'm sure these are real uh, paradigm changes uh, in US. And that's why I like US, although I practice a lot of VRCP also. I thank you to allow me to do this uh, presentation. I enjoyed scoring the abstracts, uh, performing, uh, participating to this. Uh, to the session selections and uh, very happy that there were so many submissions to the ESG days. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Thank Great you. presentations. Okay, now uh, we have our abstract uh, authors also here. So Pierre, you have a chance to ask them directly or we look at the Q&A. Maybe I, I can ask, start with the first question regarding the uh, US guided gastroenterostomy. Maybe a question to you and to Giuseppe. What is the, about the learning curve? Uh, I mean, when we started in our unit, we had in the first 10 cases two complications where we needed the surgeon. So, what is your um, recommendation when a center starts now with this new technology? Giuseppe, microphone, microphone. 
Yeah. Yeah, then you, you have data, Giuseppe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I'd actually don't have data about this in this abstract because uh, uh, this abstract uh, regarded only a part of the uh, history of gastrojejunostomy in our institution, and this was performed actually by uh, uh, already trained uh, uh, endoscopists. So there is no learning curve here. But I can say that. Uh, uh, mm, in our center, um, uh, uh, surgeries uh, due to misdeployments were actually uh, rather constant during the, the time interval. This is probably due to the fact that uh, uh, gastrojejunostomy comes at a later stage uh, during the learning of therapeutic QS. So actually, uh, 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 we are also very uh, uh, careful uh, to allow even uh, uh, people coming to training uh, uh, in our center to perform this procedure in a later stage of their learning curve after, of course, fluid collection, drainage, biliary drainage, and, uh, and uh, of course, this is probably one of the last procedure you perform. So actually, we haven't seen any learning curve effect in our center. I must say. Yeah, but there is data in the literature, and I think you made yeah. a question, uh, Muen Kashap, and I was in uh, in Tokyo also, mentioned that at least 30 cases are needed to well, to be confident in your in your yes. practice and have uh, the, uh, lower lower complications. So yeah. 30, 30 to 40 is, uh, is appropriate. So yeah, but, 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 but sort of what does that mean? How, do, how does somebody start then? You know, you don't, you don't start off with 30 cases, you have to start. So do you need to be proctored for those 30 cases? Do you need to go somewhere to do your initial 30 cases and yeah. then go back to your own place to start? Well, I think Giuseppe quite uh, uh, rightly explained that you have to go through pseudocyst collection drainage. We, we had cases where the lamps was put in the, in the collection, but then you can always uh, put a new one and take it out and there are techniques to, uh, to avoid surgery. But for GE, indeed, uh, it's better to avoid surgery and to be uh, to be proctored, of course. Yes. There is an interesting question, the Q and A, um, about experience for benign gastric outlet obstruction. We had we had in our unit also some cases. So, what what is your experience regarding benign uh, gastric outlet obstruction? And do you remove the stent after several months? I must admit that uh, we have very limited experience on benign uh, gastroenterostomies and on benign indications. Um, we had uh, some cases where actually uh, um, uh, this was the only chance, of course, for patients. And uh, in some cases, we also uh, um, performed, of course, a follow-up of these patients. But uh, um, uh, in, in one patient, we noticed us, for example, uh, um, a lot of reaction of granulation tissue around the gastroenterostomy, and finally, this patient needed the surgical rescue. So, uh, as also literature say, probably in the benign setting, this can be an option, of course, in unfit for surgery patients, or in or as a bridge to a definitive surgery, uh, just to uh, let patients, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, be uh, uh, fit enough for surgery after uh, nutrition uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. you know, very we, we are, indications. So. I think there are indications. We have some patients with chronic pancreatitis who are really completely inoperable because of viruses yeah, everywhere, of where the stand is in situ for two or three years. Mm -hmm. They can have bleeding, they can have obstruction, but you can retreat these patients. And on the opposite, we have patients who had a surgical gastrogenostomy with diarrhea yeah. and a lot of problems that we cannot go back uh, except we operate them. And the advantage of the lamps is that you can take it out and close the, close, uh, mm -hmm. the anastomosis. So there are some advantages on both sides. OK, thank you. You know, I, I just want to make a comment. I'm sure you, you, you've been doing this longer than we have, but we've started doing this now in the past year. And now we just see any of these types of cases. Our surgeons are calling us immediately. They don't want to even do surgical <laughs> surgical procedures they they want this all now done through therapeutic eus it's pretty it's pretty incredible absolutely any other questions for the moment there's nothing in the q and a no there's nothing in the q and a which i'm which i'm a little bit surprised about yeah it pierre, is pierre you, you had some questions you wanted to bring up some <laughs> topics but and then we can we can maybe start with uh, stefano about the recurrences uh, do you know any factors that were linked to recurrence? Because I could not see that in your presentation. 
Uh, I think that uh, the only factor could be the experience of the operator because we covered all the period of RFA uh, by performed it with this needle. So probably uh, in the future, we will become more confident and we will become more precise. We will refine our technique. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I, I hope that in the future, the recurrence rate will be lower. Uh, that's why also we started a randomized trial. Uh, we uh, randomized three patients in my centers and two others from Jayanta that uh, he is here too. I thank you, him for, for his effort. As you said, a uh, randomized trial is really difficult to be performed. But I, uh, I saw in Europe, there is a, a lot of confusion uh, any centers make what uh, what they what they want. For example, in your center you do not operate, but in my center surgeons want to continue to operate the insulinoma. The same with Bertrand Napoleon. Uh, he don't perform surgery anymore in his center, but only RFA. But in Milan, Giuseppe can, can confirm this. They, they the um, surgeons Professor Falconi want to continue to operate insulinoma and so on. So I think we, we must give an answer, definitive answer uh, with the, the higher level of, of evidence that is a randomized trial. So I think the effort was the worst uh, to, to be done. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you always confirm the diagnosis of insulinoma before treating the patient if you have uh, the, the, the biological and the clinical certainty that it's an insulinoma? No, if if clinically it's uh, we, we are sure. So we if we have a fast test uh, positive, we do not perform biopsy. Uh, uh, only if the surgeon has some concern uh, about the diagnosis, or if there are more than one lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, in other way, uh, we go directly for therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had, you had, this may be a, a stupid question from somebody who does not do EUS. Um, you found, I thought, more adverse events in terms of pancreatitis when you were treating this smaller size insulinomas. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And, and I assume that's just because there is probably more tissue damage because the size of the insuloma was so small and the RFA caused uh, yeah. basically damage to the pancreatic tissue. Yeah, you're right. This is probably the reason, uh, or probably because uh, insulinoma are uh, often really, really small, four or five millimeter, and it is not so easy to go perfectly in the middle with a 19 gauge needle. So probably the the treatment is not uh, perfectly centered, and the the therapeutic effect go outside. This is probably the reason. And okay, we have two more questions from the Q and A, maybe. The next question can be answered by everybody, but a question to Jayanta. Um, do you do all these advanced therapeutic EOS procedures under general anesthesia with airway intubation and antibiotic prophylaxis? Yeah. Yes, I think I think uh, what we practice in our centers or most of the other centers in Europe and otherwise must be uh, using uh, general anesthesia, but at our center, what we do is we do uh, propofol or deep sedation with uh, metazolam and pentazosin. And with that, we usually do the US procedures in a prone position. So that uh, kind of avoids the risk of aspiration. That is what we do mm -hmm. primarily for these uh, ability drainage procedures. And if the patient we feel is, is uh, getting more agitated, and, or then only we use the help of a deeper sedations. Mm -hmm. Is that before gastroenterostomosis intubation necessary? Uh, yeah, we actually use uh, intubation for eosgastric gastrojejunostomy and for fluid collection drainage, but we also shifted for just deep sedation without intubation for biliary drainage. So actually, we perform hepatic gastrostomies in prone position without uh, intubation. In, in our unit, we, we meanwhile do, don't do any intubation, so even the GE. So obviously, Pierre, are you patients intubated for the GE anastomosis? Uh, yes, we have anesthesiologists uh, who are okay. training a lot of fellows, so they prefer safety with intubation, but it takes more time, so we lose time, yeah. of course. <laughs> uh, there's, no. another, there's another question here for Dr. Kunda. Uh, somebody's asking, are you planning any prospective studies regarding a new treatment for gallstone disease 
Can you speculate what would be a possible future approach to symptomatic Gallstone disease? Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for your question um, and to the audience and also for selecting us post uh, with Anthony Teo uh, from Hong Kong. Yes, indeed, we have already prepared a prospective randomized trial looking at, uh, at the similar similar thing, you know, but in but in prospective and randomized uh, um, form. Um, and we are indeed looking to change a little bit paradigm how we are treating gallbladder stones in, in, in a gallbladder, which is natively in situ. Many of the things when we started to use LAMS came basically by the convention that we are addressing uh, patients who are mainly non-operable patients, uh, patients who are symptomatic, but with, uh, who are symptomatic with cholecystitis, but we have increasingly higher number of patients uh, uh, who are just symptomatic without cholecystitis, and we are looking also at this. Uh, the main reason why we decided to do uh, this retrospective analysis and also engage this protocol is that really stents are not designed and approved as a permanently indwelling. There is also a risk of uh, um, extended exposure of uh, gallbladder mucosa uh, to different pH, uh, which which uh, which is make it prone susceptible to to changes of mucosa changes. In the goal, but and and we are kind of like publicly disregarding this 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 main issue, which has been described in the surgical literature, you know, decades ago. So I think that we should be more careful and 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 study this more deeply. Look uh, really on uh, long term follow up data in these patients. But the but the simple an answer is yes, we have already protocol uh, uh, ready to 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 submit for the uh, to ethical committees and and uh, continue in the in the prospective manner. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Okay. I think. Okay. So no, no we, should, we should try to go now to the third part, right, Helmut? Right. Let's continue. So thank okay, you. So thank you again, everybody, yeah. for this uh, great abstract. Thank you for selecting and presenting here and for the discussion. And now we move to part three. And again, Paris. So we're going back to Paris. <laughs> yes. And core, okay. core endoscopy. Yeah, colonoscopy actually is what is not upper GI, low GI, yes, in the US, all the rest. <laughs> However, it's a very, very interesting part, according to my humble opinion of the Congress. And uh, here are the four abstracts that I um, selected, once again, based uh, on the scores provided by the members of the Scientific Committee of Dublin. So we'll start with the first abstract. This was study uh, presented by uh, Nick Barr from uh, the UK. English National Root Cause Analysis of Post-Colonoscopy Colorectal Cancer. So, uh, post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer is defined as any cancer detected after colonoscopy that didn't detect previously. Uh, the English PCCRC rate for three years after the initial colonoscopy is about 6.5% based on previously published studies. However, there's a variation uh, between uh, providers that uh, range from 3 to 13%. Uh, it's very important that it's very difficult for service for uh, centers and services to identify the cases of post colonoscopy colorectal cancers, since many colonoscopies are performed in uh, different uh, centers uh, compared to where the initial colonoscopy was uh, performed. So this is the study. Uh, the authors um, underwent a four-year audit template where the hospital episode statistics were combined with the cancer the national cancer registry and the PCCRC four-year rate was calculated uh, based on a secure online audit template. It was very, very interesting that uh, almost all centers were, uh, did participate and the, the authors managed to identify 1,724 complete cases. And this is what we already mentioned, 70% uh, of the cases were diagnosed at the different hospital compared to the hospital where the index colonoscopy was performed. These are very interesting data showing the relative proportion of um, uh, PCRC according to the part of the colon that the cancer was um, detected. And you may uh, anticipate that the transverse colon, hepatic flexion, and ascending colon were the hot, the hot red spots uh, with the, uh, the highest relative proportion of a, a PCCR detection. Here in this table, you see that the um, 59 percent of the cases were symptomatic cases, where almost one fourth of the case was a case of surveillance. Um, uh, also, in uh, almost one fourth of the cases, 
the, pro, the operator reported any difficulty uh, in the colonoscopy, and this could also be a risk factor for post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer. Inadequate bowel preparation was um, recorded in 15% of the cases, and uh, the authors uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the cancer could be uh, avoidable uh, uh, in 70% of the cases. The main results of this study is that more than 1,700 cases of post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer were identified, with 70% uh, of them uh, being diagnosed in a different hospital from the index one. Uh, transverse colon, hepatic flexion, and ascending color are the uh, spots that were more probable to identify to detect a uh, cancer. The main conclusions here, for the first time, the authors provide some robust uh, process for root cause analysis for, for post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer. 70% uh, of them could be avoidable, where in 45% of them, uh, there was harm for the patient. In the future, this could be the base in order to create new evidence, uh, to provide new evidence to target, to target for improvement measures. And this is something that also our society could also take into account during the next uh, years. Uh, the second abstract that I would like to present comes from uh, Italy, from Milano, and was uh, presented by Francesco Mandarino, and it's uh, entitled Propofol-Based Sedation Managed by Gastroenterologists versus Deep Sedation During Endoscopic Procedures in Low Anesthesiological Risk Patients as a Scores 1 and 2, a propensity score matched comparison in a single uh, tertiary center. So, we know that propofol, when we use it in our endoscopy suites, is associated with better patient and endoscopy satisfaction, and of course, with shorter recovery times when compared with other sedative agents. We also know that there is a continuous debate whether propofol should be allowed to be used by personnel without expertise in the field of anesthesia. In clear words, if it could be used by non-anesthesiologists. The aim of the study was to compare the safety outcomes between Non anesthesiologists administered propofol sedation, this is called the NAAPS, and anesthesiologists assisted deep sedation, AAP, during diagnostic endoscopic procedures for low risk patients, patients with ASA scores one and two. So, this was a cohort study of uh, prospectively collected data in the San Rafael Hospital in Milano, uh, where all patients with low anesthesiologic risk, uh, ASA one and two, who underwent upper GI endoscopy or lower GI endoscopy. Um, were included, and uh, patients received other NAPS or target control diffusion or uh, AAP, as previously discussed. These are the inclusion criteria: uh, adult patients with low risk, uh, low other risk score, and uh, exclusion criteria where any uh, urgent procedure or sedated drugs uh, not included propofol. The authors performed the propensity score matching analysis, including age, sex, BMI, sport, smoking, uh, cardiovascular diseases, and of course, examination time, in order to standardize baseline variables. These are the results. You may see that for both upper GI endoscopy and lower GI endoscopy, both the unmatched results that are presented on the left part of each table, as well as the matched results that are presented on the right part of the tables uh, didn't, did not differ in terms of statistical significance. So the rate of adverse events that were detected in both groups uh, were similar. So in this study, the authors saw that there's a very low rate of adverse events in both groups, that's lower than 1%. Uh, percent. There was no difference between the two groups. The main conclusion would be that the uh, NAAPS represents a safe sedation modality comparable with safety outcomes of anesthesiologists assisted deep sedation. In future, uh, there's a question about the cost effectiveness analysis about the uh, patient satisfaction and about of course, medical legal issues per country. The third abstract that we will discuss comes from uh, Philippe Leclerc uh, in, from uh, Belgium and is entitled Residual Malignant Cells are Present on Endoscopic Instruments and or Working Channel in almost half of the cases after endoscopic biopsies for cancer or ESD. So our guidelines suggest that uh, obtaining possible non-neoplastic biopsies before suspected malignant lesions to prevent uh, the intranumular spread of malignant disease. However, there is a very scarce data to support this recommendation, and uh, this recommendation has recently been approved with a low level of evidence, as you may see in the slide. 
Uh, the aim of the study was to search for residual malignant cells after endoscopic biopsies in case of colorectal cancer or after endoscopic uh, ESD for a uh, case of early neoplasia. And these cells were uh, seen in the endoscopic, uh, in the working channel of the endoscope or in the biopsy forceps or the ESD knife. So uh, overall, uh, the authors included uh, 13 ESD cases and 26 diagnostic colonoscopies with biopsies from cases with colorectal cancer. And they shared these malignant cells in three ways. The first is the instrument sample where they shut the empty biopsy forceps or the ESD knife in a cytolit vial as soon as the endoscope was removed from the patient. The second is the flash sample where the authors uh, flashed the endoscopic work channel with 20 ml of saline. And third is the brass sample where a, a, a brass, usually a brass was uh, passed through the uh, endoscope working channel with, um, in order to uh, check for any residual malignant cell. And this uh, brass was uh, shaked into a cytolit vial also. So the authors uh, separated their sums in two groups. The first group was a proof of concept phase and included um, all three samples together. So the instrument sample, the brass sample, and the flash sample from the 13 ESD cases and 10 uh, cases of biopsies for patients with the colorectal cancer. All these samples were pulled together and analyzed together. The second phase was the localization phase where the patients um, checked the uh, 16 uh, cases of uh, biopsies from patients with colorectal cancer and um, analyzed these three samples separately and tried to identify where exactly the malignant cells come from. Here are the results. It's very, very interesting that in 70% of the cases of uh, uh, colorectal cancer biopsies, uh, the authors detected malignant cells they detected malignant cells in 31% of the cases of ESD or erinoplasia. Uh, here's the group A, the first phase, the, group, uh, the, phase, the uh, proof of concept phase, where all sums were grouped together, just to remind. Here, in a more uh, specific way, we have the results of the group B, where the authors try to identify where exactly do the malignant cells come from. And as you may see on the slide, 44% of uh, the instrument samples were positive compared to 19% of the brass samples and 38% 38 of the flash samples. So um, it's uh, important that the uh, instrument itself and the flash from the endoscopic work channel provide more often uh, positive malignant cells. However, when we took all this together, it's impressive that at least one sample was positive, 56%. And at least one working channel was positive in 44 of the patients. So very, very high numbers. The main result of this uh, study is that the presence of malignant cells in the endoscope working channel and or through the scope instruments is almost fit, in almost 50% of the cases after biopsies for colorectal cancer or after ESD for early neoplasia. The main conclusion is that there's a contamination of the endoscope working channel and all the instruments that we use during our procedures may occur, and this may occur often enough, in my opinion. And in the future, we should uh, try to understand if there is any clinical significance of these findings, if there's any risk of seeding in other uh, parts of the uh, GI uh, lumen, and of course, further studies should be uh, conducted. Finally, the uh, fourth abstract for the core endoscopy is about uh, restricted diets that are not necessary with current bowel cleansing standards, results of a non-inferiority clinical trial. And this trial was presented in uh, Dublin by Salvador uh, Aklat from Spain. So we all know that bowel preparation is of paramount importance for a high quality colonoscopy. And of course, we also know very well that dietary restriction has a negative impact on patient satisfaction, quality of life, and of course, willingness to repeat the examination. Up to date, the EEG recommends a low fiber diet the day before the colonoscopy. And there has been no study comparing the use of one day low residual diet versus three day low residual diet regimen. In this trial, the authors uh, performed a non inferiority multi center randomized trial. Patients were stratified according to the DIG score regarding their risk of um, 
uh, inadequate bowel preparation. All individuals were fit positive individuals that performed, uh, that underwent morning colonoscopy. And they received split preparation with a PEG and the ascorbic acid and bisacodyl where needed, wherever needed. The table shows you the baseline demographic characteristics where there was no difference between the two groups. Uh, the group that uh, received unrestricted diet and the group that received one day of low residual diet before colonoscopy. And you see that overall in the intention to treat analysis, 278 patients were uh, included in the unrestricted group and uh, uh, 275 patients were included in the low residual diet group. Here are the results. You see that um, the rate of adequate uh, colon cleansing was 96.4% uh, for the group of unrestricted diet compared to 97.8% for the group of low residual, residual diet. And this difference did not um, reach the level of uh, non-inferiority. So there was no uh, difference between the, these two uh, percentages. And uh, when you look on the right side of the slide, the percentage is the rate of excellent bowel preparation. So a nine score at the Boston a scale, you see that the group of unrestricted diet uh, succeeded that at 56.8% compared to 65.1% uh, for the group of uh, uh, one day of low residual diet. Finally, it's uh, important to underline that uh, the unrestricted diet had the better performance in terms of uh, good diet tolerability among uh, patients undergoing colonoscopy, and uh, that was preferred uh, that the patients that uh, received the unrestricted diet uh, did not uh, prefer to be assigned to the other study group compared to patients that were uh, assigned to the one day of low residual diet that would prefer more often to be assigned to the group of the unrestricted diet as shown at the table at the bottom of your slide. In terms of the detection rates, you see here that there was no a difference in any of the detection rate, including serrated at the normal right column, serrated at the normal at the normal right column, adenoma detection rate and polyp detection rate or polyp detection in right column. So no differences at all. To conclude, the main results of this study is that the adequate bowel preparation was achieved in 96.4% of patients um, receiving unrestricted diet compared to 97.8 for patients that received one uh, day of low residual diet with no, different, with no inferiority on unrestricted diet. Tolerability was uh, higher in the group of unrestricted diet, 94.7% compared to 83.2% for the group of one day of low residual diet, while adenoma correction did not differ between the two groups. The main conclusion is that the regular diet is no inferior to free diet for adequate preparation. Regular diet is more tolerable and preferred by the patients, and there is no effect on colonoscopy outcomes. In the future, uh, we need to validate uh, this unrestricted diet in different settings, like difficult populations as in patients or um, in case of diagnostic indications only, uh, in patients that did not undergo colonoscopy, I mean for surveillance or for feed positive as in this study. And of course, it's very important to evaluate uh, this uh, study in uh, other uh, preparation products, apart from uh, the one that was applied in this uh, uh, study. So these were the four restricted, the four abstracts that I would like to present you. And just as a reminder, that all material from uh, Dublin is available for fifteen, uh, for three more weeks online till June thirty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paris. And Thanks, Paris. For announcing nice. the demand period. Yeah, great selection and great abstracts. Um, There's a, a question, uh, Helmut, yeah. here. Two questions. There's actually two questions within yeah. one. Uh, yeah. The first one is for Dr. Leclerc. Uh, and the question is, how risky is it to take biopsies from normal appearing tissue through a biopsy channel already likely contaminated by malignant cells? I never do this, but doing a prospective study may not get ethical approval. <laughs> what do you think? So we, we don't have so many data about uh, this risk. We can, um, based on the data coming from uh, uh, the Dutch team, from Leon Moons, published in uh, 2019, they evaluated the risk, not uh, about taking biopsies, but the risk of uh, doing a polypectomy 
after uh, taking some biopsies on a colorectal cancer, and they evaluated the risk about around 1%, 1% of risk of reimplantation of tumor cells on the site of the polyp resection. That's the only data that I have to, to, to share with you. But my study do not support this because it was not the aim of my study. Mm -hmm. If it's okay. it's, may I ask you to this point another question? I mean, this is for sure. If we uh, would uh, inform our patients, I would have um, yeah big concern uh, uh, um, that they get similar to the dinoscopes with the infection. Have we now to inform the patients that if we biopsy a cancer, we can spread a tumor? So um, my question is: Is there a? Do you think there is a clinical relevance, and how high is the percentage? Uh, that a patient gets a tumor after biopsying a cancer and we, 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 we biopsy on another different area. We know this is in, in theory, it's possible, the data shows it, but has it a clinical relevance? Can we, and um, I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> yes, of course, I, I don't have a definitive answer for that. Uh, that was not the aim of our study. Yeah. Um, but. We did this study because the, the evidence was very low. And as everybody of us, we are reading the, the ESG guidelines and we see such guidelines supported with the low level of evidence. We wanted just to confirm the data coming from Leon Munz in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Netherlands and from uh, Thomas Reusch also from uh, Germany, who showed also that uh, some uh, tumor cells uh, can be uh, present in the working channel. Mm -hmm. So that. The only thing I can answer you tonight, but the chance of uh, having uh, a metachronous uh, cancer due to other manipulation of the colon after bi taking biopsies of colorectal cancer has been suggested to be around one person. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's it's not it's not uh, it's not big, but it's not so difficult to. Avoid this by taking biopsies on the colorectal cancer at the end of the procedure, if it's possible. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, I have a question, uh, Paris. Well, actually, if Nick Burke at Burr is here, um, what, what was the denominator? There were about seventeen hundred post colonoscopy cancers detected, but I didn't. I didn't. You probably said it, but I didn't see it. What 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 was the denominator? In other words, what was the percentage? But thanks for the question. And so this audit um, was purely just looking at the post colonoscopy cancers. So that's one thing we don't know from this. It's a denominator for all of them. So we know from our national work that the rate of post colonoscopy cancers is about 6.5%. So of all colorectal cancers, 6.5% will have had a colonoscopy up to three years before. The miss rate for anybody just turning up for a colonoscopy is probably about one in 300. But the variation is huge, depending on um, indication, risk factors, everything like that. The important thing when trying to interpret this data is to just think about the denominators. So for all of the things we've shown, the uh, surveillance uh, population being quite high, we need to then look at our national endoscopy database and then just see how that uh, matches up. And other things like We've shown lots of things like having a trainee present um, didn't seem to be a high risk um, uh, of all of the factors. The denominator is key. So we can highlight potential issues and it just needs further work. Did, did you know who the providers were? In other words, were they gastroenterologists, surgeons, uh, nurse practitioners, family practitioners? I mean, if you look at the data from Oh, it was probably what 15, 20 years ago, the Canada study out of Toronto that looked at yeah. it was a lot of non-gastroenterologists that they seemed to find that was there was a higher percentage of these post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers that were occurring. Do you have those data? Yeah, we do have uh, those data, and it was gastroenterologists in around 50% of the procedures, and that's probably less than the nat national picture. But again, we need to just match up those numbers specifically before you start leaping in and drawing conclusions and then you've got the problem that who are the patients that the gastroenterologists are performing the colonoscopies on is it the ibd surveillance where we know this is very high is it the 
polyposis syndromes, probably. So it, it all needs to come with a health health warning and a caveat. But we can we've just started to explore those types of things. Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, just a question: uh, Could you please elaborate a little bit on this seventy percent of avoidable lesions? Yeah. So we asked. Um, at the end of the uh, in-depth root cause analysis for people to do more kind of uh, make statements about uh, causality. So we asked four questions. Was it uh, possibly avoidable, probably avoidable, or definitely avoidable? And asked people after they'd been through the thought process to then say um, on those type of criteria. It's very, very difficult, um, and we use the World Endoscopy Organization broad ca categories. There are four groups, whether a procedure was deemed adequate, um, inadequate for whatever reason, poor prep, poor follow-up, um, and then whether polyps were removed or not, and whether a lesion was left behind or whether it was possibly incompletely resected, and that just helps people then decide. But yeah, some clearly are, say there's been a big, large non pedunculated polyp that no procedure was rebooked, um, clearly avoidable. And then but the shades of grey, but we're just trying to tease out um, more from that. I, I have a question to Salvador. Um, I was really surprised about the results. I, I really would say, I expect in my patients that I can, if I see the colon, I know what I have eaten the day before. Uh, <laughs> um, whether endoscopists blinded in your study was it mentioned maybe i missed it can you repeat please i didn't get the, the last you said whether endoscopists blinded did say no which groups the patient were the diet yeah 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 they were blinded they were blinded yes okay yes. okay but then i missed it because yes. I, I really and there was a question other in the in the in the chat uh asking um uh, those with a uh, low residual diet, how much heavy residual food did they actually consume? I have seen huge differences in people who, are, for example, consume seeded bread, which can make suction impossible due to channel blockage. And this is my experience as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it is really, uh, com it can re be really cumbersome to do quantitative study with diets. So we, uh, we asked the patients for a three days a dietary record, a logbook, and we analyzed it in a qualitative way. So I can give you an exact answer. But anecdotally, I can tell you that uh, in, some, in one of the hospitals, endoscopists were complaining that uh, free diets was not good. They were looking uh, finding a lot of seeds. And so I made um, a little analysis just to check if everything was okay. And there was it was not uh, um, directly related with the with the assignment group, and and on the other hand, when in the uh, dietary logbooks that I was uh, checking for the study, uh, there were some uh, patients uh, like uh, eating a huge amount of uh, uh, seeds and fiber that was really clear from the logbook, and uh, they got the Boston nine, so we did not find an effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a question about the propofol study, because I've been in here in Israel, uh, we are able to give propofol. I've been giving balanced propofol sedation for almost 20 years. And if somebody told me I had to stop doing it, I'd probably stop doing endoscopy because uh, it's wonderful. So my question really is, is this going to change practice at all? We, we've actually published a number of years ago, a couple of papers on this in colonoscopy and one actually in ERCP. But um, you know, I can tell you from my experience in the United States, this has always been a financial issue that has come mainly from the anesthesiologists that that they want to be there because they get paid to do these procedures. But it's certainly much more cost efficient if gastroenterologists and we actually do a better job giving moderate sedation. The anesthesiologists give deep sedation. And I just wanted uh, the thoughts of the author uh, about that study and it's and it's uh, value in terms of potentially changing practice. Okay, thank you very much for uh, for the question. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of studies which have compared deep sedation with propofol and uh, gastroenterologists uh, which manage propofol. But this is, this is a, a big project 
And this is the, the first step of the project comparing uh, safety outcomes of this kind of, um, of, uh, of sedation. And the, the news and the novelty of this project and uh, that we in uh, our institution in Italy, we use a target controlled infusion propofol that is uh, um, a little bit different uh, from uh, uh, bolus administration. And um, I think that there are few data about this kind of administration because uh, uh, TCI is a way to perform uh, um, and to ensure a steady concentration of, of the drug during the procedure. And uh, it's easier to manage also in endoscopic room because uh, um, only a nurse can uh, can manage the uh, endoscopic practice, uh, such biopsies or other kinds of things, and um, there is there isn't the need of uh, um, a nurse that uh, had have to um, administer the drug. And this is a, a good point, but in our opinion, because uh, there are a few data about uh, the use of PCI, but by gastroenterologist. But I think that uh, uh, this project is, is composed by this, this first part, and uh, uh, there is an ongoing project about cost analysis, and uh, there are not some cost analysis data about the, uh, the managing of propofol by gastroenterologists, because uh, uh, it can be in the future after demonstrating uh, the same safety outcomes and also efficacy outcomes in performing colonoscopies, uh, uh, such as adenoma detection rates or other kinds of, uh, of outcomes. And uh, uh, this can be the starting point to, uh, to take new evidences to, um, to, to take around the world and to take uh, and um, to ensure um, a unique opinion about the, um, the managing of uh, of this drug but also by a centrologist and not by anesthesiologist i think did you did you measure capnography when you were when you used propofol no in our institution no no okay yeah we don't and we don't either. also in also an experimental setting there is another trial with capnography but not in uh, in usually clinical practice Francesco, the gastroenterologist, but it's also fellows, or were they? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's a good question. Were they specially uh, trained for this kind of? Uh, yeah, all gastroenterologists in our institution, and also in the in the trial, um, are trained by Advanced Life Support uh, Certificate and. Uh, uh, at preparation about the manage the management of adverse events, okay. and uh, both fellows and uh, um, and uh, physicians uh, and older physicians uh, uh, manage propofol. But uh, in the situation that uh, the uh, trainee uh, is is performing the procedure, there is also um, um, another physician. So in the situation that the fellow is the physical operator, there is a one endoscopist, and in the situation uh, in, in in which there are two um, two endoscopists, uh, the fellows uh, take care also of sedation, and um, there is this type of, of organization. But also fellows in our institution uh, have uh, the certificate of advanced life support and and uh, can manage also adverse events during the procedure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I think we covered all questions. Uh, no. No further question on the Q and A. No, uh, Paris, I think we're good. Ready? Or do you have any questions, Paris? No, thank you. No, I am. If not, I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm good as well. I think then we can stop here. And again, thank you to first of all to Paris and and Pierre. You did a great job. And to all of our abstract authors, thank you for joining and explaining. Your abstracts again. Uh, it was, uh, I think, and it was a great uh, um, webinar today. And you, uh, our participants have still the option to have uh, the on-demand period until the 13th of June. And for those who cannot wait, uh, please become member and take advantages of ESGE because it's it's really worth to be get to, to become a member. Uh, because of our Congress next year. You see here on the slide, the on-demand period. And this is what next year, I am, now you can take over. You can explain what is so special next year. Uh, well, next year, we're gonna have actually the 60th uh, anniversary Jubilee. So 60 years uh, celebrating ESG and advancing endoscopy in Europe. And we very much look forward to those who were with us in Dublin to join us again in Berlin. 
for those of you who weren't with us or have never been to ESG days, it's really, it's a wonderful Congress. Uh, we had over 31 uh, people who attended. I think we're going to have uh, Helmut probably over 4,000 people in Berlin. Yeah, so uh, we're already getting prepared. We hope to see all of you there. Okay. And for those uh, who are still interested in the best of ESG days, we have another, a third part of um, the highlights. It's uh, the live demo and George Webster and Thomas Rush will present their cases, their special cases where you can ask them directly and all the, the, the endoscopist will be um, um, uh, taking part in this webinar. So please join us on the 28th of June for the next webinar. So thank you and a great thank you to David and Gab Gabby in the, in the back who uh, support us always that this is so running uh, smoothly. Thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Good night to our friends in India. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night.